Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. You're joining us this morning for our Cardiovascular Regeneration Conference, which is the presentation of a journal club and a work in progress. First up is Li Lai, who got her PhD degree in 2013 from East China Normal University in Shanghai. During her PhD period, she studied psychological and pathological, physiological, I'm so sorry, physiological and pathological <laughs> angiogenesis <laughs> using a wide range of animal models, which leads to many discoveries in anti-tumor angiogenesis compounds and mechanisms underlying those. Since 2011 and during her last two years of her PhD period, she joined the Texas A&M Health Science Center in Houston as a visiting scholar where she moved on to study G protein coupled receptor LGR4 in mammary gland development, which leads to research in breast cancer and retinal development. With a comprehensive background, she has been either first or co-author in 12 papers with over 300 citations. She joined Dr. Crook's group in 2014 and has been working on transdifferentiation from fibroblasts to endothelial cell and metabolism. Today, the paper she is going to present is titled, Rare Variant in Scavenger Receptor B1 Raises HDL Cholesterol and Increases Risk of Coronary Heart Disease, which is in accordance with Dr. Pownall's presentation on HDL afterwards. Thank you for your introduction. So the paper I'm going to share today uh, is published on Science last year. And you can see there are a lot of um, authors on the list. And uh, you, you can see it's really a collective effort of many well-known lipid field experts. And Dr. Pono may be no better. And would you comment a little bit for <laughs> the um, authors? OK, let's go ahead. So to start, um, uh, the classic hypothesis of L uh, HDL is higher equals better. And this hypothesis is supported by many large-scale uh, clinical studies, including Framingham and Helsinki Heart Study, uh, sta started from 40s and 80s, respectively. And uh, in the trail of, L uh, of LDL-reducing drug, Jim uh, uh, Brozio trail, uh, the results also showed a negative correla correlation of HDL and uh, the, uh, cardiovascular disease. However, in recent years, there are new evidence against this theory. First, not all patients uh, with low HDL uh, present with coronary heart disease. And second, mouse model uh, that enhance uh, hepatic HDL in cholesterol ester transfer, uh, high HDL cholesterol level in cholesterol ester transfer protein normal patient does not uh, cardioprotective. Uh, what's more, um, patient plasma with similar HDL cholesterol level have different capacities for cellular cholesterol efflux, meaning not only the HDL level matters, but the HDL function also matters. All those evidence suggests that HDL is not as good as people originally think. So let's l take a look at the general lipo lipoprotein model. A lipoprotein is a biochemical assembly whose purpose is to transport fat molecule in water, as in blood or extracellular fluid. They have a single layered phospholipid and uh, cholesterol in the out shield, uh, with a hydrophobic core containing triacid uh, cholesterol and uh, cholesterol ester. Apolipoprotein, apo, uh, ApoA, are embedded in the membrane stabilizing the complex and giving it functional identity. So HDL has the highest density and the smallest size among the five classes of lipoprotein. And it collects uh, cholesterol from the peripheral tissue and take it back to the liver via pathway of reverse cholesterol transport, which is a multi-step process. The current RCT model uh, includes three steps. Step one is uh, uh, cholesterol efflux from microphage uh, to the pre-beta uh, HDL under the regulation of ABCA, ABCG protein, uh, depends on the involvement of the APOA protein. And the second step is uh, the cholesterol acidification by lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase, uh, LCAT, 
which generates a mature form of LDL. The step three um, is a selective hepatic uptake of HDL cholesterol via SRB1, uh, which is a key protein in the paper I'm going to share today. So what is SRB1? Uh, SRB1 stands for the scavenger receptor class B1, and uh, it's a major receptor for the HDL. Uh, it is a membrane protein and undergoes glycosylation in the endoplasma reticulum. And uh, in terms of its function, it promotes the selective uptake of HDL cholesterol ester into the liver and uh, in mice, hepatic SRB1 overexpression uh, reduces the plasma HDL level in, and is as a protective. Uh, and uh, in the uh, SRB1 knockout mice, the HDLC level is high and uh, is estrogenic. And so, uh, uh, in, and, uh, however, the impact of SRB1 on HDL metabolism and the coronary heart disease risk in human remains unclear. So in, in this paper, the author performed a study for SRB1 variants in a large number of human samples, with, uh, which uncovered the rela uh, relevance of these discoveries in mice to human diseases. To outline this paper, uh, uh, the author firstly show how, uh, how they discovered this uh, CARB1 variant, and then they reported uh, its HDL-related phenotype. And next, they tested the impact of the variant on the SRB1 function. At last, they performed meta-analysis mm -hmm. to determine the association of SCARB uh, uh, variants with coronary heart disease in humans. So firstly, and most importantly, how, do, how they found these variants. So uh, the author studies two groups uh, of subjects. One includes 328 participants with very high HDL level, HDL cholesterol level, uh, which is greater than 95th percentile. And uh, the control group, uh, which is low HDL uh, co concentration, including 300, 398 subjects, and uh, the level of HDLC is less than to a 25th percentile. And then they undertook a targeted, and uh, uh, they undertook a targeted um, sequencing, re resequencing discovery experiment among them. In this cohort, uh, they sequenced. Uh, where is my mouse? Sorry. Oh. Uh, in this cohort, uh, they, um, they sequenced the axon of 590 genes located with 300 KB of each of 95 loci uh, which were with significant association with plasma lipid level, which is identified by the Global Liquid uh, Gen Genetics Consortium uh, as of 2010. And as a result, a hom homozygous in which uh, leucine uh, replaced proline 376, named P376L, for gene SCARB1, the gene, uh, uh, the gene encoding SRB, was found in a 67-year-old uh, female with extremely high level HDLC of 152 um, milligram per deciliter, who harbors no mutation in other high HDLC genes for example, CETP. For other um, uh, hashizygous were identified by targeting sequencing in the high HDLC group. None were found in the low HDLC group. To identify additional uh, uh, p 376 l carriers, they genotyped and expanded the cohort of very high versus low HDL subject. Among 524 additional subjects with very high HDLC, they identified uh, 11 heterozygous for this variant. Virus among three, uh, 758 uh, subjects with low HDLC, they only identified three heterozygous. In total, they they are com uh, they combine the their combined sequencing and the genotyping for discovery of this variant showed that this variant is significantly over uh, represented in subject with high HDLC 
population with a, uh, with a p-value of 0 0.000127. So what is the HDL phenotype of this variant? So the author next recruited the P376L homozygote, eight heterozygote, and both high HDLC and normal HDLC non-carrier controls for deep phenotyping of HDL metabolism and related trends. In the panel A, they firstly found uh, that there is an increase in large HDL particle uh, in the homozygote compared with non-carrier control. The, in panel B, they show that uh, the total cholesterol and the uh, APO lipoprotein A1 level in the HDL were significantly increased uh, in the homozygous and uh, the heterozygous compared with the control. But the HDL APO A2 level uh, were not significantly uh, elevated. However, there is no significant difference in the uh, free cholesterol uh, level and uh, the uh, cholesterol ester level and uh, the ratio between the two. And the cholesterol efflux rate is also not affected, suggesting that this variant may not affect the early step, uh, steps in the reverse cholesterol uh, transport before the SRB2, uh, SRB1 is taking action. Next, the author uh, tried to understand the impact of this variant on SRB1 function. They generated uh, induced uh, prepotent stem cells using the peripheral blood mononuclear cells from the P376L homozygote and the non-carrier control. They next identified these cells, uh, uh, the next uh, differentiated these cells into a hepatocyte-like cell, HLCs, to study the HDL metabolism in a setting of endogenous cellular CARB1 expression. So compared with the control IPS hepatocyte li lines, those from the P3176L homozygous demonstrated a profound reduction in selective cholesterol uptake from HDL in vitro. To evaluate, evaluate the uh, physiological impact of this variant on HDLC level and the catabolism in vivo, they used the adeno-associated virus vector to direct uh, hepatocyte, uh, hepatic overexpression of Y-type uh, SRB1 or the P376L variant in the ACARB1 knockout mice. Mice expressing Y-type ACARB1 demonstrated a robust uh, decrease in the um, uh, uh, decrease in HDLC level. In contrast, uh, the P376L uh, group expressed uh, uh, had had not has no reduction in the HDLC um, level, and this um, level is comparable with the uh, NOR group. And the clearance of the hydrogen strip uh, labeled HDL cholesterol ester was much slower in mice. <sighs> much slower in mice. Uh, com uh, slower in mice uh, in the P three seventy six L mice uh, compared with the Y type, and it is uh, it is comparable with the NOR uh, group. And the right panel shows a study, uh, statistic result. <coughs> and the selective HDLC uh, uh, cholesterol ester clearance from plasma was also increased by Y-type SRB1, but, not, uh, but was undetectable in the P3176L expressing mice. And as I mentioned earlier, SRB1 is a membrane protein and undergoes uh, glycosylation in the ER. And the location and the post-translation uh, post processing is important for its function. So next, the author hypothesized that the markedly reduction in the HDL cholesterol ester uptake could be because of the variance um, processing of this uh, uh, SRB1 protein, which leads to impaired cell surface lo uh, localization. So firstly, the author claimed they did uh, the experiment and uh, see uh, and found a reduction of surface as SRB1 protein, but I can't find the real data in the supplement data. Uh, so, mm, 
um, but we just believe that. So first, and then there are also focused on the um, focus on the glycosylation part. Let's focus on that. So the endo glycos um, the endo glycosidase age is uh, an enzyme that target target the target the uh, sorry where is my Oh, I can't find my arrow. Okay, I can. Um, uh, the, this enzyme is uh, targeting the glycosylation. So after the endo H treatment, the protein, the uh, glycoprotein, will be processed into different forms with different molecular weights. Uh, depends on its resistance to this enzyme. So high protein, a uh, high molecular weight forms represent the mature N-glycosylation modified endo-H resistant and uh, partially endo-sensitive uh, forms at the cell surface. And the lowest molecular weights represent the fully endo-H sensitive where form, which is an uh, uh, immature form. So the author measured the molecular weight of SRB1 forms from endo-H treatment and the lysate from the IPSC derived differentiated HCL cells from the control and the P376L homozygote. First of all, uh, they found much less total cellular SRB1 in a, mu in a mutant uh, cell lines relative, uh, uh, relative to that of Y-type cells. But more importantly, after endo uh, age treatment, the forms of SRB1 from Y-type uh, cells was predominantly uh, the partially select, uh, sensitive forms, uh, along with small uh, amount of the fully sensitive form. But in contrast, the SRB1 from P376L um, uh, HLC was all the immature, fully endo age sensitive, sensitive form. Similar phenomenon is also found in, in lysate from the mouse liver expressing Y type or mutant SRB1. So after endo H treatment, the SRB1 from Y-type liver uh, lysate is predominantly the partially sensitive form. In contrast, uh, the SRB1 from the, the tissue lysate of P376L expressing liver was all the immature, fully endo H sensitive form. Together, these data uh, are consistent with a model that in which the P376L uh, variant alters the endogenous post-translational glycosylation of SRB1, which ultimately result in a reduced cell surface expression. Next, they also wants to want to find the association of this variant with uh, coronary heart disease. So what's the phenotype of this uh, homozygote? Uh, this um, P376L homozygous subject had no clinical uh, CHD, but her carotid intimal media thickness was in the uh, great was greater than 75th percentile for female of her age, and she also had detectable plaque throughout the left intimal carotid artery and as a bio, uh, uh, bifurcation of her right intimal carotid artery. Be but because of the small sample size, the st statistic power is limited. To achieve greater statistic power to determine the relationship of this variant uh, and the CHD risk, they performed a meta-analysis meta of large exon array genotyping studies of CHD cases and healthy controls. According to uh, 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 49,000 CHD cases uh, and 80, um, 88,000 CHD controls, the P376L carriers had a higher risk uh, of CHD vs non-carrier um, uh, uh, non-carriers, suggesting the carriers of this uh, SCARB1 um, P376L variant have an increased risk in um, HDL and increased HDL uh, cholesterol level. <coughs> To conclude, this paper showed uh, strong evidence in human with large sample uh, size that despite the elevation of HDLC level, 
These P376 uh, L carriers exhibit increased risk of CHD uh, as do uh, SCA RB1 knockout mice. And reduced hepatic SRB1 function in human impairs uh, reverse cholesterol transport, which leads to increased risk of CHD. Also, the SRB1 upregulation or enhancement may be a therapeutic option for reducing CHD risk in the general population. So with this, I, I want to thank Dr. Pano for choosing the paper and giving me tremendous help in this presentation. And also, I want to thank everyone for listening, and uh, I will take any question now. Thank you. So let me go ahead and start off with um, an initial question. So is there any phenotype within these SCARB1 negative deficient or mice that doesn't have um, a non-HTEL related phenotype? And if yes, does this phenotype also exist in your P376 L homozygote? Okay, so um, to answer this question, uh, the phenotype in the SR, uh, SCARB1 deficient mice, mm -hmm. uh, they are infertile. As first of all, they are infertile. Oh, so okay. may, uh, this is very relevant to Dr. Pono's uh, mm, project, and maybe she can have more answer to this, but they are infertile. But uh, uh, this homozygous, the human homozygous, mm -hmm. they, uh, she has two healthy baby and uh, didn't report any infertil infertility problem. And also, uh, in the mice, in knock mice, they have problem mm -hmm. in the stereogenesis, and also they have a hyperactive platelet phenotype, which, okay. is doesn't, which is also uh, not uh, mm, show in the human heterozygous. So maybe it's, because, maybe it's because the human males, there are a huge difference, and yeah. uh, also it's important to push every research uh, in the human, I think. Very interesting. Anyone else? Questions? Dr. Well, just a comment. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's a really important paper because it helps us to understand a little bit more about the role of HDL in um, human disease. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to think that because of the epidemiologic studies that you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk, the epidemiologic studies, like the Framingham study, suggested that HDL was, was positive. That uh, and indeed people that had higher HDL tended to have less cardiovascular disease. But that was higher HDL within a, a certain range. Um, we've never, I have to say, never really known as clinicians what to do with these people that come in, like this elderly woman who had a HDL cholesterol 120. 52. What, uh, 152. 152. So what do you do with that? Well, um, in, in that case, what we've decided to do, most of us uh, just treat the total cholesterol and get the total cholesterol down. We didn't really know what to do with the high HDL cholesterol, because HDL cholesterol was the good cholesterol, supposedly. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I think Dr. Palm is going to shed a little bit more light on this. Um, it's, it's a more, we have a more nuanced view now of HDL cholesterol uh, because of uh, more prospective studies. The epidemiologic studies can provide clues, but sometimes they can be misleading. And uh, the subject there's, there's, there's some good there's some good other examples of that in cardiovascular medicine. Um, but I, I think I'll, I'll see Dr. Pauno uh, illuminating us about the role of HDL in human disease. Well, I just make uh, one point that's really really important. Everybody here does a lot of mouse work, and mice are not men, and the the, the phenotypes <laughs> that you get. <laughs> Uh, and the phenotype that you get with uh, mice and men may be profoundly different. And in the SRB knockout mice, they have very high HDL and they get, they're uh, susceptible to atherosclerosis. And the opposite is true of the overexpressors. They're hmm. resistant to athers uh, atherosclerosis. So, Interesting. very cool. So while you finish setting up your presentation, um, this is Dr. Henry Pownall, who will be presenting next. And he wanted me to emphasize that he came here from rural Pennsylvania with the Amish and the Quakers. And apparently <laughs> he grew bored of such things and went to visit the incredibly not so large town of Elizabethtown, where he attended college in Pennsylvania and earned his bachelor's of chemistry, starting him down the path that leads him here today. Since this has occurred, he has hopped around the Northeast, earning a master at Wilkes College, 
and a PhD at Northeastern University, both in chemistry. And he's yet to learn the whole rule of silencing your phone during meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so after this, um, his PhD and his master's were completed. He came to Houston at the University of Houston, shifting a focus from qualitative chemistry to one on prebiotic, prebiotic synthesis. This work led to a position at Baylor College of Medicine where he began exploring the more translational fields, including but very much not limited to peptide design, lipid synthesis, enzymology, and that's really just to name a few. He has been co-PI on two NIH-supported clinical projects which looked at the etiology of dyslipidemias among HIV patients rece receiving antiretroviral therapies where he identified optimal therapy for managing their lipid risk factors and has also been a co-PI on the Look Ahead study that evaluated ob obese and overweight diabetic patients on how they responded to either intensive lifestyle intervention or usual care. Here at the Houston Methodist Research Institute and in the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration, he is using his over four decades of multidisciplinary research to focus on the HDL dilemma, which I believe he will be covering about in his talk today. So Henry, if you'd like to start. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the great introduction from, from uh, the Journal Club. Uh, I'm going to talk about SOF-mediated rescue of HDL function. And in the context of uh, the Journal Club, there are two functional things we're aware of. One of them is uh, it's correlated with uh, atherosclerosis, high HDL, uh, less atherosclerosis. However, uh, lowering HDL was not really therapeutic. Uh, it's also in mouse models associated with uh, uh, female infertility uh, in, in the deletion of the HDL receptor. So we began, these are my collaborators, uh, you know, Biba Gillard, Karina Rosales, uh, that's me, and then William Lagore is a collaborator at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, a good guy, somebody. Uh, we should have over here to speak sometime. So here is uh, a little more background. And, and I'll just read to you that SRB1 mediates uptake of lipids in this order, free cholesterol, cholesterol ester, and least of all phospholipids. And the concept of selective uptake is that it is not an endocytic mechanism. It does not take up the entire particle. It takes up only the lipids and let, lets the uh, protein go. And Dr. Gillard showed in a JVC paper earlier this year that occurs by so, her so-called nibbling mechanism where it just takes one or two lipids at a time and then lets go of the particle. Uh, the SRB1 uh, knockout mice have twofold higher plasma total cholesterol, mostly as HDL, as you would expect. Uh, the HDL as uh, Lily showed in her presentation is two times larger, and she showed that that was also true in the human uh, variant. Uh, HDL is free cholesterol rich, and this is a big difference, 17 versus 58 mole percent. And interestingly, 58 mole percent is similar to nascent HDL, suggesting that maybe this is a non-metabolizable HDL that never matures. And then, according to Law, and this is part of the hypothesis, according to the law of mass, mass action, a higher mole percent of free cholesterol could increase the total body free cholesterol burden. And because HDL transfers freely with a half time of five minutes. And so once it's on a lipoprotein, it can go anywhere. And we'll see some evidence of that. And then lastly, the wild type HDL cholesterol ester is greater than that of the uh, 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 knockout, which uh, you actually wouldn't expect. It should be the other way around. So there are really some strange things about the, the HDL in these uh, uh, knockout animals. So this is more news about these knockouts. They have aberrant platelet and erythrocyte morphology and function. They're atherosusceptible despite this high HDL. The females are absolutely infertile. And then the then the go, we go on to say that the HDL-SRB1 atherosclerosis axis is complex. We know that modest 
gain of function is atheroprotective, uh, total loss of function is atherogenic, but ultra high SRB1 gain of function, which induces very low HDL, is as atherogenic as the knockout. So another part of the background is compared to wild type erythrocytes from the SRB1 mite have reduced lifespan, lack the biconcave shape, uh, a condition that's normalized by incubation with uh, 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 serum, uh, uh, and uh, which normalizes uh, the uh, morphology. Uh, both the serum, normal lipidemic serum, and beta-cyclodextrin remove free cholesterol from the HDL. So, that, so there's something about the high free cholesterol content that makes it uh, pathological. And then with respect to the platelets in the SRB1 null mice, they're larger, they have multilamellar structures, they're free cholesterol rich as well, are cleared faster, and have impaired ADP-induced aggregation. And so we ask the question, is this related to free cholesterol bioavailability? So we've worked on this protein serum opacity factor for uh, several years, and this uh, protein was discovered, or activity was discovered in the 1930s when an infectious disease doctor discovered that patients infected with, with strep pyogenes had cloudy plasma. He'd collect blood, spin down the red cells, leave it on his bench, and suddenly it got cloudy. Uh, so he just called it serum opacity factor. No work was done on that for another 40 years. And then uh, just about 10 years ago, uh, an investigator, Harry Courtney, at the University of Tennessee, showed that the target of uh, serum opacity factor, or I'll call SOF from now on, is high-density lipoproteins. So we collaborated with Dr. Courtney, who provided us with the protein. And uh, he sent us one milligram, and in one year, we published a paper just with that one milligram protein, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, we, we characterized the mechanism, but I want to show here, this shows up here, yes. So this is size exclusion chromatography of HDL. It's that red. You add four micrograms of SOF, and you get this big peak here. You get this smaller one here, and even smaller one here. We later identified this one as lipid-free A1. And remember when we talked about selective uptake that the SRB1 rejects the ApoA1, what eventually becomes free. And Dr. Gillard also showed that uh, in her cell studies. And then we get this uh, other, if I can find this, oops, get on the screen. Th this other particle, the middle-sized particle that is uh, here, and this is free cholesterol poor. All, most all the cholesterol, ester and uh, free cholesterol are in this larger particle that elutes in the void volume. This particle contains all of the, one particle contains all the cholesterol esters of more than 100,000 HDL particles. And this particle is also, because it's large, it uh, scatters light, and because it scatters light, it makes plasma opaque, and that, that's where we get the opacity factor. And this shows briefly, uh, so these are some early uh, EMs showing the CIRM, that large particle, with little things that we think are HDL on the surface being taken up by the particle that is mediated by uh, SOF. And so roughly the mechanism is HDL represented by these little things go to SOF, and you get this very large CIRM, you get this discoidal neo-HDL, and then you get lipid-free ApoA1. And this is the mechanism uh, that we came up with based on, uh, am I on the screen, or where's my, oops, didn't want to do that. There we go. So SOF has a high affinity docking site, this yellow, which binds to uh, the first HDL, the host, with high affinity. And another HDL, the guest, diffuses in uh, and uh, binds with the uh, low affinity docking site 
here, you end up with this intermediate. The cluster esters flow from the guest to the host. You end up with a fused HDL. This guest gets extruded. Now it has none of its lipids. It's just protein, some phospholipid, no cholesterol ester. And then uh, it later forms this, it grows, and then finally it grows. And this is shown just as a triangle because if I were to put this on the screen, it would fill the room by comparison. And notably, the uh, surface main protein is ApoE and ApoE heterodimer with ApoA2. So that got us to thinking that if we have a ligand, ApoE, for the LDL receptor and all that cholesterol on one particle, that the particle would be di diverted to the LDL receptor. So Dr. Rosales conducted an experiment where she injected SOF, 4 micrograms, into a wild-type mouse. And that's shown here, and as you see, you get a good reduction in the, uh, there we go, in the 43% reduction, and it remains at this level for at least 20 hours. But it does not work in ApoE knockout mouse. So now we know that that part of our hypothesis is sound. The second part, doesn't work very well in the LDL receptor knockout, but it can work some because there are multiple APOE dependent receptors in the liver. So, uh, other data that I don't show here shows that the uptake is almost exclusively hepatic. So, this is a test comparing the opacification of in black. Uh, the wild type HDL and in red SOF or HDL from SRB1 knockout animals. And as you see, the rate is only 50% of that of uh, wild type for the SRB1 knockout. So we know that the physical properties of this HDL are different. So then we looked at the activity of uh, SOF against uh, HDL, shown here for wild type. And we get our product, the serum in the void volume, this Neo-HDL here, and lipid-free A1 in here. It doesn't show very well. Uh, but in the knockout, we, st we get ac some activity, but still some of the HDL remains behind. So this again shows that it's a resistant. And that's for protein absorption. When you just measure cholesterol, it gives you the same picture. Here's the serum, here's the uh, uh, HDL, but here it's gone in wild type. But a little bit remains behind compared to here in the knockout. So uh, I think you can read this. I'll just summarize it. Uh, Dr. Rosales uh, uh, obtained a plasmid uh, in encoding the SOF gene with uh, res uh, restriction sites. And um, this was cloned into a plasmid, which was eventually sent to the University of Pennsylvania uh, Vector Laboratories, which provided us with an adeno-associated virus for SOF. So we tested this at three doses. Uh, the middle dose, which Okay. This shows uh, just that all three doses, one, three, and ten times to the tenth, uh, ten to the tenth genome copies, cloud the uh, plasma or HDL, and that's that's shown here. This is an in vitro experiment. Then we took uh, five microliters of plasma from the mice expressing this, and just incubated with HDL. And that is shown in panel B. If I can get this here. Why doesn't, why doesn't this work? Uh, there we go. And it shows all three doses produce the, the lipid-free A1, Neo-HDL, and the CIRM. And this just shows down here that on chow or a high-fat diet, 
and the high fat diet was done because we're going to test this in an atherosclerosis model using a high fat di diet to induce atherosclerosis. Uh, that the SRB1 knockout has uh, lower cholesterol here in the, on chow, lower cholesterol, uh, but on the SRB1 uh, knockout uh, with the AAV or with the SOF is much lower. And then over here, we just compare what have, again, using size exclusion chromatography, uh, mice on chow, here's the HDL, this is with AAV. Here is knockout mice, and this is showing protein. Uh, for uh, blue is no uh, AAV, uh, black is, uh, the GF, uh, red is GFP, the control, and black is uh, our SOF. And you can see it is robustly moved from HDL to just Neo-HDL and our CIRM. And this just shows the same data down here for cholesterol and uh, this distribution of the cholesterol. Here's HDL, here's CIRM, here's the Neo-HDL. Now this is different from what we obtained in vitro, uh, excuse me, by injecting SOF into mice. We never saw the Neo-HDL. So under the conditions of constitutive production of SOF, we always see uh, Neo-HDL. And this is important because this Neo-HDL compared to HDL is a better acceptor of cholesterol efflux from macrophages. It's a better substrate for lessening the cholesterol acyl transferase, the middle step in RCT. Uh, so it may have additional cardioprotective properties. So this you've never seen before. Dr. Rosales noticed that the mice, female mice, given the AAV for SOF, began having puppies. In fact, and we compared it then with what we were using, a well-known drug that reduces HDL probucol, uh, try to get better litters because we couldn't do homozygote to homozygote breeding. And those of you who work in mice know that that adds a lot of time and expense if you have to always use heads. And so the mice were fertile. But this compares the data. 21 to 40 days after giving AAV, well, 21 days is about the gestation time for a mouse. So this basically restored fertility within 24 hours. Probicol, not so much. Not as high, wasn't for seven weeks, and it's much lower. So this is our uh, preliminary data showing that this HDL is dysfunctional in the context of fertility. And we're uh, setting up a collaboration with um, a IVF group at Wild Cornell, uh, a big group. The, and the, uh, they, they have a lot of patients, and they also have a lot of publications, so they're really great. And to get plasma samples from them to see in a large group whether there's any difference in their HDL. We haven't fully planned what uh, metrics we'll use, but that's our plan, and we're going to write a R21 on that. Uh, I think we're almost done. Okay, this is some data. This is under review now, but this uh, just emphasized the idea of how fast free cholesterol can move. Uh, it moves between HDLs with a half time of five minutes. So we labeled, uh, and this is with nascent HDL, the early particle that uh, we think is similar to the HDL and SOF uh, treated animals. And if you look at the free cholesterol, it's gone in five minutes, half time of five minutes. But it shows up in the liver within five minutes. And look how much shows up. It's almost 60% there already. Phospholipid, same thing. Phospholipid is a little more co complicated because it can be hydrolyzed. Hepatic lipase, LCAT, and other things. But still, nevertheless, very fast out, very fast in. In contrast, ApoA1 has two components. This is expansion in the uh, fast components, expansion in the extravascular space. And then the real kinetics is this, which is about seven hours. 
and very little is sh shows up in the liver. So we plan to use this method to look at uh, bioavailability in the uh, SRB1 uh, knockout mice with and without SOF, which brings us to the hypothesis we're going to test. One of them, does SOF uh, prevent atherosclerosis? And the second one is, does it reverse? So this is, uh, shows a scheme, birth, wean, transition to an atherogenic diet, give them AAV, SOF, or GFP here, and then follow them for uh, 28 weeks. Sacrifice, compare the control GFP with the SOF. And then does it, re do you get regression? Similar design, except they're on this diet for uh, a certain period of time, and then we give them SOF at the end of diet. But they stay on the diet, because removing the diet would have too big an effect. OK, let's go back. And, uh, and then we sacrifice and compare them. The other thing we want to do is test the hypothesis that delivery AAV SOF to the knockout mice normalizes erythrocyte and placement physiology and morphology. And last, we compare the plasma kinetics of wild type and knockout uh, uh, mice uh, free and esterified cholesterol. Uh, simultaneously identifying the tissue sites of free cholesterol and cholesterol ester accretion and the effects of AAV SOF versus AAV GFP on these kinetics and tissue distributions. And lastly, to determine the in vitro rates of wild type and SRB1 uh, knockout HDL free cholesterol and the HDL transfer in vitro. And uh, that's been submitted this week. And Thank you. <laughs> Doctor. Really a fascinating story, the, the serum of pacifying factor. Um, lots and lots of questions. I'll just ask one to start. I'm sure other people have questions mm -hmm. too. But what, the, the uh, SOF is derived from uh, a pathogenic bacteria, right? Um, what is the immunogenic effect? of this protein? Have you looked to see if antibodies are developed to it over time? They are, uh, and this is according to Dr. Courtney, our collaborator. The people who are infected with the bug uh, have uh, uh, antibodies in their uh, blood. And uh, they're, they're, they're not really high titer, uh, and, uh, and we don't really have uh, uh, good antibodies for this at this time, and you know what? If you don't have, can't do a Western blot, uh, it's, uh, life, life is hard. Yeah. Uh, there are other, couple of other challenges with the SOF also. One of them is uh, to isolate large quantities of it. We have tried to do that. Uh, fortunately, it's, it's active at a human dose of uh, one microgram. Mm -hmm. And that's why people who get even impetigo, which, but from strep pyogenes, may have cloudy plasma. Not, so little has to get in. It's active, ten, active at 10 to the minus 14 molar. And so that may be even more uh, active than catalase, which is the, you know, the classical uh, high throughput uh, enzyme. Uh, we've tried to engage two companies to uh, produce large amounts of it. They both, neither could do it. So uh, we have another collaborator. We're working around. Uh, we're, very engaging to get us help to do this so we can get an x-ray structure and do uh, structure function studies on the protein. You can't propo propose mutants mm -hmm. rationally without having a, an x-ray structure. That's where we are. May I uh, introduce you to another potential collaborator sitting uh, to my right here, <laughs> Dr. Bruno. Uh, I'm sure she has some questions about how RNA might be useful in this RNA therapy. I think we've talked about it a bit. Uh, like a year ago, yes. Have you looked in the sequence, the actual sequence, if there's any kind of domains there that could potentially be important to the company? We have, and we don't know what it means, but it has a large domain that has like very high homology with von Willebrand factor. Oh, interesting. Mm. 
So if anybody knows what that means, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> Um, anyone else have questions? Because I have one that might wrap us up fairly well. Be good. So one of the things, since we're in the Center for Cardiovascular Regeneration, we've very much shown again and again that there are Goldilocks zones, meaning that there is too much of a good thing for these. And I think the papers today definitely reinforce that. But you're dealing with cholesterols. You don't just have one molecule. You have such a wide variety of them. And you even mentioned the NeoHDL, which might have other protective function, which is hardly being yet explored. How do you think we'll take all of this information and hand it over and work with clinicians so that way we have better information for actual health and patient decisions? We're going to go there if we can. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. This is only a proof of principle. Mm -hmm. We're not likely to give humans SOF. But we know the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to do is design a small molecule with a high affinity docking site for HDL and a lower affinity uh, binding site, delipidation site, and test that in, in uh, vitro first in animals and then maybe in humans. Uh, I won't be involved in that. <laughs> uh, the second possibility is just to screen compounds for something that could opacify plasma or HDL. And that can be done pretty easily. Mm -hmm. We talked to a couple of people who haven't started in that yet. Uh, we're a small group uh, trying to stay focused and at least finish something. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time today, and well done. Good job. Have a good one. Before everyone leaves, uh, are we off, Kyrie? Are we off now?